great shout this morning. I know, I know, this is a video glitch. It's not really me on Youth Takeover Sunday, right? But uh, I'll let my youth take over in me if I can somehow lift my check to the Lord. <laughs> I tell you what, you hang around young people, it'll keep you young, right? Just have 10 grandkids. It'll keep you young, amen? Days off will mean more to you, all right? Anyway, some of you get it. I got one laugh, Jim, Tim, yep. Today is a special day. I love having the youth, because they're not the youth of tomorrow. They are the church, they are the church of today. And uh, so we're, we're excited to, to see them consistently. They do what we do from a young age. From a young age, they preach the gospel, right? As a child, we teach them to preach the gospel, to, to love people and to care about people and be compassionate towards people. And uh, so I'm very thrilled. And for those of you who didn't know, the first song we sang in worship today, did anybody recognize that song? Well, let me give you a little background. The, the guys wrote that at their VSI this summer, and they just finally finished producing it and getting it all ready. And it's, I think it's the first time on a Sunday that they've sang it. But didn't they do an amazing job? Yes. And uh, so it's exciting to see them and hear the depth of what they're writing. You know, it's not just fluffy stuff. You know, it's, it's, it's powerful. It's about vision. It's about purpose. Why? Because there's depth in our children. There's depth in our kids. And if your kids are not involved, I encourage you, don't let them make the choice. Yeah, obviously they need to choose, but so many times we, we as parents, we, we give up so much of what we need to. We're called to train them, right? Every champion needs a good trainer. Doesn't matter how good you are, how gifted you are. All these football players are going to take the field today, right? And they're amazing. They get paid a lot of money for athletic ability, but every one of them is submitted to a trainer. Someone that will tell them what they need to do and they obey. And same thing with your children. You're not raising children, you're raising champions. You're raising adults that are going to be the church of today. We need your kids activated today because the greatest battlefield for the church and for people's lives today is in our school system. Right? And we need to send our kids to school equipped. If you're not going to equip them, I would encourage you to take them out. If you're not going to equip them, take them out because they will be overtaken. Right? So you have to prepare your kids for what's to come. How do you do that? By keeping Christ in the center of your home. Amen? We have to remember what Jesus did. Jesus talked about remembering when he, when he went to the table with his disciples. And he said, as often as you do this, I want you to remember what I'm about ready to do for you. I want you to remember what happened on the cross. You know, just like today, it's 9-11. How many remember where you were on 9-11? I remember what was going on that day. And maybe some of you are too young to, to remember. But, uh, you know, we, I remember. I remember where we were. I remember shopping at Walmart South. I don't know why we were down there shopping that day when we have one right here. But we were down there shopping. And I remember just dropping the cart, looking up at the TV screens I used to have in there. And could not believe what I saw happen. And when it hit the Pentagon, I immediately, we came to gather what? Our children. Because we just did not know what was going on. And I'm here to tell you today, you don't know how long you're going to live. You don't know when the Father will send. Only the Father knows. Jesus himself does not know when Jesus is going to return. And that's a day worse than any 9-11 for some people. Those who don't know and those who have, who have said no to Jesus, those who have rejected his mercy, those who have rejected their purpose. He lets you choose. But remember what he said? He said there's life and there's death. He nudged us in the right direction. He says, choose life. Choose life. You have the right to choose, but here, hey, here's, here's what it's going to cost you. Understand the cost of your decision. Understand the cost of the things we allow to get into our children's mind, the things we allow to get in our mind. And I want to talk about that a little bit today, about the roots of life. What are you rooted in? Who do you hang around? Who's, who's affecting the, the, the fruit in your life? It starts with who you're rooted with, who you're, who you're hanging with, who you spend a, a lot of time with. And so I just want to in, encourage you with that today. And we're going to get into the Word in just a moment. just want to quickly greet all of us, all the guys there in Bethany today. Team Bethany, we're proud of you. We're excited about that, what you guys are doing there. We're excited about all you guys up in Dover, Team Dover. We, we appreciate you. And uh, Dulles and, and, and Dorchester, we're so proud of all of you that this atmosphere has been multiplied uh, throughout the region. Can we give all of our uh, satellite campuses a great hand? And
and of course, our, our pastor, Pastor Bert Pretorius, who, who uh, founded 3C and uh, sent my wife and I to this region, to our own country, to do what we do today. And I'm so glad that we didn't just go. I'm glad that we were sent. Because when you're sent, you're covered. And I, and I want to speak to that for just a second. We see the world in chaos. We see independent people in chaos in the church. And I'm not here to knock them down. I'm not here to touch any anointed who has fallen. But by the grace of God, there go I. So it's not with a religious, pig-headed, I'm better than you attitude. But I pray for them. Instead of yapping about people, talk to Jesus about those who have fallen and pray that God would restore them and bring them back to where they need to be. It doesn't matter the stupid decisions they've made. If we had all of our stupid decisions up on the screen today, we would be embarrassed. We would be embarrassed about what's put out there. And so and I know, you know you can think, well, they deserve it and they should never do that. You know, I, I deserve hell. In fact, all of us, the only, th the only right you have is to go to hell. That's it. When mankind fell, hell was the only option but God. Amen. He stood up and said, no, not on my watch. He sent his son down here to redeem us from our decisions and give us an opportunity to choose again. He could not choose for us, but he made a way for us to choose again. Amen. So, so it's in the context of that thinking that I want us to go into today's message. It's in the context of eternity. There's a place called time and space is where we exist. It's what we know best. You know, it's the most valuable commodity you have. And that's the, some of the strangest thing for someone to say is they don't have time to serve God. They don't have time to do their purpose. They don't have time to, to walk out what he's asked them to walk out. You're telling the God who created you, and he is the creator of time, that you don't have time. And he's the one asking you to do this. It's, this is his letter. He's the one that's challenged you, hey, this is the way to life. This is the way to fulfill purpose. This is the way to multiply your time back to you. And yet we have more value in our finances and our careers and our ambitions than we do the time we spend with knowing him. Remember that's your first calling, men of the house. Your first calling is to be a good son, to be a good son to the father. Ladies, you're, you're mothers of nations, a good daughter to God Almighty. That's our first calling, to be in relationship with the Father. The reason he created you was to dance over you. The Bible says he dances over you. He sings over you. He adores you. Even when you're in your greatest sin, he says, while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. While you were creating your worst, see, Jesus gets a bad rap in this culture because they tried to minimize him to dead gods. Where they expect Jesus to coexist with people who are in the grave. He's out of the grave. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Don't ask Jesus to coexist with a dead God, a false God. Are you hearing what I'm saying today? And uh, so I know that puts you in a, in a different bracket when you speak like that. But it, I don't care about the brackets of the world. What I care about is what God has asked us to do. I trust him that if we will speak the truth, that people will be made free. It's only the truth that makes you free. And only the truth you know will make you free. Speaking the truth Tell them the truth doesn't do anything for you. It's when you become the truth. What does that mean? Jesus is the truth. His life is the truth. And when you become in relationship with him, it's there you experience the greatness that God has for you. So I want us to, to, to listen to this message. And, and I would very much encourage you to go back and listen to the previous message. I think we're on this 14 weeks, is it? 15 weeks, something like that. Three of the weeks just on mercy. Right? Isn't mercy a powerful thing? You know, to be merciful, to, to be able to, to be merciful to people. What does that mean? Take action, get involved in people's lives, help them get from where they are to where they need to be, right? And that's what gives you the, the strength to, to, to be what God has called you to be. So let's go quickly into this. The way to happiness and joy and peace is through mercy. You know, when, we, when, when God reaches his hand down to help us to get where we need to be, he gives us the grace. Mercy speaks to doing and, and getting to where you need to go. Grace speaks to, hey, you're not going to be penalized for that sin, right? He, he's not going to punish you for that sin when you walk in his mercy, when you walk in his grace. Amen. I don't want to re-preach that whole thing, but the way to misery is cruelty. Cruelty is the opposite of mercy. It's a cruel thing. You know, you see people stop in the car to pick up a turtle off the road 
And then they have a bumper sticker that says they have the right to murder a baby. Got quiet in here. You see, we, 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 we have a perverted thinking. And that's because we veered from the truth. We veered to, to more of a motivational thing. Hey, let's feel good. Let's leave everybody here feeling good. Listen, the call of God on your life will always interrupt what you're doing. Just like as a man. Who's the guy who said she was a beautiful woman? Cole, where are you? That marriage is going to interrupt your manhood. Right? And I'm saying that from a positive point. Right? Thank God my wife interrupt, interrupted my stupidity 39 years ago. Right? I needed her in my life. And it's the same thing with a relationship with Christ. It will interrupt your pattern. A relationship with Jesus, sometimes it feels like it's dragging you down. No, it's, it's putting roadblocks because you're running straight for hell. And what he does when you come to a relationship with you, he slows you down. Hey, whoa, 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 look what you're doing. There's another day you totally wasted. You lose that day, you don't get it back. You lose five minutes, you don't get it back. You can lose a million dollars and get it back. But you can't get any moment wasted back. It's just helping somebody. And so the word warns us. Jesus is not cruel. He, he, he wrote this letter years ago. And he's warned us over and over again since the beginning of time how to come back to him. He's, we see his grace and his mercy. Even in heaven, there's implements of the tabernacle where God tried to give Satan an opportunity while he was still Lucifer to repent. And he said, no, God is not unmerciful. But there's coming a day where he stands, today he stands at the throne of grace. That's where he's at. He's at the throne of grace. What does the Bible say? Come boldly to the throne of grace. And it's urgent because God divided things up time. Time was never meant to be forever. Time and space is a temporary setting to prepare for eternity. And yet we treat time and space as it's the main deal. It's important during time and space that you do certain things and you enjoy it. It's a great gift. I love time and space. I love what God has done in my life. I love being married for 39 years. I love having three wonderful children, and they found three wonderful children. They got married, and now there's a lot of them. <laughs> and I love every moment about that, but that's just a little taste, if you will, of what eternity is going to be like. That's just a little taste of how God the Father sees you. As you figure things out in life, it makes him laugh. I heard that our, one of our grandsons learned how to get out of the crib this morning. <laughs> Early this morning, I was just hearing a little bit of the story before I came up. How he went through the house, he's playing music on the phone, helped himself to a mac and cheese that you take the top off and then put it in the microwave. This kid's, you know, he's still in the bottle a little bit. He's putting mac and cheese in the microwave. <laughs> While mama's getting ready for church and she thinks it's the other kids running around the house. I don't know if I'm getting all the facts right, but, but God gets a laugh out of that. I'm sure she didn't like the mess he made, but she didn't disown him as a son. And I know it sounds funny, and cute, but your life is the same way with the Father in heaven. He sees all the mistakes you've made, how you could have burned the house down putting something flammable in a microwave. He's seen the mistakes we made along the way, but he doesn't do away with you. You're his son. You're his daughter. Come on, say, Lord, I need your mercy. I'm grateful for it. He'll never stop celebrating you. But there's going to come a day when the mercy, when I say never in time and space, the sixth dispensation that the Bible speaks about in time, we're in it. Where are we? We're at the very end of the sixth section. There's one section left, seven. And that's when Jesus, he came as a baby. He was beat up. His blood was taken for him to pay the price for our sins. And we're going to receive communion a little bit later today. That's why you need to understand the blood he shed and why he shed it. He came as that baby. He, he, he was a savior. He, he was beaten. He was bruised. But he called the shots. Okay, now you can take me. Many times he would get up and leave a town because say, now's not the time. There's more people I need to get to. But when it was time, he gave his life. He gave his blood. And he was beaten. He looked like, didn't even look like, they didn't know if he was man or beast. It wasn't that they didn't recognize who he was. They didn't know what he was. But I can tell you today, where my Jesus sits, 
that my little granddaughter was just singing about. Let me tell you about my Jesus. He's no longer the broken body in a tomb. He's no longer, he is resurrected. He's no longer a, a dark-skinned Jew. He's now in heaven, son of God with hair of wool, eyes of fire, in the countenance of his face, lights up the universe. And he's on the throne of grace, and he's, he's asking you, come, come to me, turn your life to me. Because he knows what his next job will be. He's going to return. He's going to take those who said yes to him home. We're going to, we're going to have a thousand years to, to fellowship. Just a little, you know, a little pre-cocktail hour, if you will. A thousand years. And then he's going to come. He's going to call the dead. He's going to call all the dead who said no to Jesus. The ones that stayed here on the planet and continue, I don't know who's going to occupy this building after the rapture, but all the people who come in here and use this for whatever, I don't care. It's all yours. If you stay, you can have it. Everything in it. My house too, 705 Pine will be all yours. But I pray that you come with us. One decision. One choice. God's not mean, but he's not going to have this nonsense. He's not going to have his children stay in torment all their life. Because some of you have been through hell. Some of you are going through hell right now. You're going through distractions. You're going through torment. You're going through loss of life. All kinds of things that is a result of the sin of mankind. And he's letting this thing play. He's letting us have our will. He's letting us have our choices. But he's still in the game. He's still waving. Hey, there's a choice over here. This choice is life. Come on, I know the crowd's loud over here. It's pulling you to a lot of different places, but Jesus Christ is still waving his hand. Hey, sons, hey, daughters, come on home. Come back to life. Come back to purpose. Because he knows what his next job is. After that thousand-year reign, he's going to come back, and he's going he's to he's deal with the dead. But he won't be on the throne of mercy. The Bible says he'll be on a throne of judgment. And everybody who said no, all the arrogance and all the excuses that we come up with to say no to Jesus and do it our way. How we justify our sins. When you say no to him, eventually the mercy expires. Once he stands on that throne, there is no longer mercy. And the Bible says, well, you can read it. I was going to read it at the end, but it just, it's happening now, so I'm just flowing with it. It's all the way at the end here. Let me go to the end. He says, and I saw a great white throne judgment. This is John in the book of Revelation. The revelation of what? The revelation of Jesus. He wasn't just a baby. He wasn't just a disciple maker. He wasn't just our savior. He's also at the end, the judge. He's given us the opportunity. He stepped off his throne. He came down. Don't you tell me that God's mean. Don't you tell me that he's unmerciful. He's been waiting on you for a long time. And yet, even today, you're getting another warning. Why? He loves you. He's gazing after you. He's begging you and pleading you with you. And he says, and the one sitting on it, and the earth and the sky fled from his presence. What does that mean? Nobody then wanted to be around Jesus. They were full of fear. Because you see, once Jesus' presence leaves this planet, once the Holy Spirit leaves, and he leaves everybody to their own demise, once people have said no enough, he's going to extract. In fact, the Bible says he's delaying that coming so that some of us can make the right decision. We're in delay right now. We're in what you call overtime. God's holding it. It's kind of like a soccer game. You never know when the overtime's over. The clocks are never right in high school games. It drives me nuts. I'm like, what is up with this soccer stuff? I, I was at a game watching one of our kids, one of the guys from Dorchester play, and I, I was texting Jeff. I said, what's going on? Is this halftime? What, what are they doing? No, it's double overtime. Okay, somebody needs to score. Okay, why does it say two minutes on the clock and we have 10 minutes? I, I don't understand. What is that, you know? And, and here's the thing. It's the same thing with the kingdom of God. We don't know the time. Because here's what we would do. If we knew the time, we would do what we want, when we want, and then just before we, boop, kind of like homework. My senior year in high school, I went to my English teacher and said, you and I both know I'm not graduating, right? What must I do to make it happen? He said, you need at least a D or a C on your final exam. I can do that. 
I went home and I studied, I studied, I studied, I prepared for that exam. Got a B plus. Come on, somebody. I'm not as dumb as you think I am. I was just lazy. I was sharing with some of the guys starting Bible school. I said, you know, Dr. Dr. Ron Cottle gave me my first F in college. He failed me. He said, I don't know what school you went to, but that's not how you write a paper. I guess I shouldn't have been copying my brother's papers and turning them in. Maybe I would have learned something. He left all of his term papers home. I'm going somewhere with this. And I found him, and I would dummy him down to a C. Because he got all A's. He just breathed. He got an A. I don't know. He got it all. And uh, anyway, but that's how it is in our faith. We're, we're writing other people's papers. We're parroting what we've heard someone say. But do you know him? You drop in Jesus' name. Oh, in Jesus' name. Who is he to you? Hmm? Take five minutes to just sit and do nothing else but listen to him. How do you listen to Jesus? Read his word and then be quiet. Turn off the music and listen. He really wants to know you. He will speak to you. Amen? Okay, let me just go back to the beginning again. I'm going to cut out some stuff. I want you to say three things, and I want to give credit because we live in a Sue happy world. Um, excerpt from Momentum. It's a book written by Colin Smith. Not, I don't know anything really about the guy, but I ran across this book. I, I've been reading it and listening to it. It's about the Beatitudes, and I liked how he wrote this down. And he says, the Beatitudes show us how to make progress. There's a definite order in the Beatitudes, and each one flows from the other that went before. And, and he, he described about how a plant roots, the shoot, and then the fruit. Come on, say root, shoot, fruit. The Beatitudes do more than describe a blessed life. They give us the road map. Remember, this was Jesus' first sermon. It was a foundational thing. And how many realize no matter how old you get, Cole, Foundations are not old-fashioned. My suit may be old-fashioned, and it's not tight enough, or the pants aren't up to here, right? <laughs> Fashions change, you know, is, is, you know, everything's just different, you know? But, but, but at the end of the day, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just having some fun with the youth. My, my point is, is the foundation of who Christ is. And you can see today, but you saw the young people up there with their, their contemporary and their modern dress and apparel, you know? But, but the foundation of what brings us here is the same. Come on, somebody. The blood of Christ that was shed, it's the same for all of us. You can wear your suit, you can text to give, or you can write a check. The blood of Jesus is the same. Are you hearing me today? And so it's important to understand that you grow. Actually, we could learn a lesson, couldn't we, Paula? Because somebody got a hold of a, her signature and a check and wrote some checks on the church account. They got away with $10,500. So maybe we need to listen to what Cole's saying. Those checks are dangerous. <laughs> we were sitting up one night, do you know a Julian? A Julian? Julian who? And next thing I know, blip, 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 we realize we've been hacked. But see, here's the thing. They think they're getting away with it. And many of us, we think the same thing in our, our life because we, we pray a prayer or we attend church or we, we give something away, that that's our salvation. And that's why Jesus said very clearly that if you don't know me, you're not going to spend eternity with, eternity with me. You're, you're not going, no, no, depart from me, he says. I don't know you. Yeah, but I did this in your name. Yeah, you dropped my name all over the place. And I honored my name and people did get saved. I honored my name and people did get healed, but I still don't know you. You're the one that spoke my name, but you don't even know me. The fact that they read the Bible one day and they had faith in me and you spoke my name, yes, they received that miracle. But it had nothing to do with you, Mike Rittenhouse. It had nothing to do with your lying, cheating ways. I don't know you. Because I can tell you, when I prepare this message, it smacked me in the face. I don't want to take a chance for a moment to stand before my Lord and say, you know what? You're a fake. I don't know you. Amen? 
Same thing, with, I don't want my wife to, when I, when I got married 39 years ago, I go home every night. I speak to her every night. I spend time with her every day. And when I go out in public, I end, hey, this is my wife. You see a call, my beautiful fiance. <laughs> and this guy down here grinning like a chessy cat. He's getting ready to get married. <laughs> Mr. Producer. Huh? But it's not a marriage if you don't go home. To, it's not a relationship if you don't do life together. Sunday's not enough. Hey, babe, I'll see you next Sunday. It's where I met you. It's where I left you. I'll see you next week. <laughs> huh? Shoot, boy, that'd be a price to pay. Not coming home. And so don't give God a bad rap because he put rules to the game. What would a soccer game be without the sidelines? What would a football goal being made without the goalpost? I, watch, I, I like watching those MMA reels, because I, oh, I guess I got a short mind on the, the quick knockouts. And I watched this one the other day, this guy's running around the ring, just running from the guy. I'm like, dude, you're in the wrong sport. You should be playing soccer. <laughs> and then when the guy got a hold of him, I understood why he was running. I'd have ran too, right? And he's like, oh, you know? And anyway, so it's, 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 it's the rules are there to make things great, not to mess it up. God loves you. And that's where it has to start. That's what he's asking of us. Come on, know me. I don't want anybody to perish. It's not his will that anyone should perish. But many will. Because they refuse. They refuse. It's who they hang around. What was the first one? They're poor in spirit. Well, when you recognize that you're poor in spirit, what are you supposed to do? You mourn it. You mourn the fact that you don't have what you need. But you don't mourn to death. You mourn to life. And the mourn, the mourn that you do, the mourning that you do, it takes you to a place of meekness. In other words, you don't give up your strength. You just play by the rules. You submit to the process. You submit to the training. You submit to the work. You submit to what has to happen. On game day, you show up. You don't go to another place. Right? If you're playing today, you know, Flacco's playing. He, he shouldn't show up in purple. He's wearing green now. When you show up in life in the community, do you show up with Jesus uniform or do you show up with whatever you want? Do you bring him with you? Do you introduce him? This is helping somebody. That will take you to life. Being meek does not mean being weak. It's I have submitted everything I have to what I'm in. I've submitted my life to Christ. Every asset, every, everything that I could possibly have, I don't give that up. I just submit it to the cause that he has for me. And that he has for you. And so the roots grow to shoots. And out of the root comes the shoots. And careful what you're rooted in. Careful what you hang around. The fourth beatitude that we talked about was to hunger and thirst. That's the fruit of the first three. When you realize you can't do it. When you realize you're broke. And, and you have nothing to offer. And that you need the Father in your life. You need people in your life to become. It, it causes you to mourn. And then it causes you to submit. And then what happens? You begin to hunger and thirst for what is righteous. I'm on a constant cycle since I turned 50. Uh, 50 not 15, 50. And, and, you know, and in the last nine years of being 50, it's, it's like when I'm training right, I eat right. You know, when you go to the trouble sweating, and working and, and doing what you do need to do just to stay healthy. It's not even about winning a game. It's just getting through the day, right? I want to be healthy enough to go through a day and hang out with my grandkids and, and not have to go to bed at seven. That I can still function. And, and in that process, there, there's an understanding that if I'm training right, if I'm doing the right things, if I'm showing mercy, if I'm engaged in what God has called me to do, the exercise then when I go to eat, I'm going to hunger and thirst for fresh, good water. When I'm eating right, the only thing I want to drink is water and Jesus juice. That's coffee. That's all I want. But you start craving. Remember the days of going through the drive-thru, getting two very happy meals. Right? And just woofing it down and keep on going and working. Suddenly your body can't handle that and it starts showing up in places. Right, in your joints and in your brain and uh, everything. It just messes you up. 
I want to tell you today, you can turn it around. You can turn life around by what you take root in. What you're absorbing into your spirit, it can take you to a place. And that's what happens. You become hungry. You're hungry and thirsty for more of Jesus. Oh, I just got to know him more. Oh, that training, that sweating I did. Oh, I just need to know Jesus more. I just need to walk with him some more. I don't want to just drop his name. I want to say, hey, here he is. Here's the fruit of my life. Amen. Come on, give Jesus a great hand of praise. So when the roots of the first three Beatitudes are nourished, somebody say nourished, a great desire for righteousness will spring up. Well, how are you nourishing your roots? How do you nourish your roots? Do the Bible. Tell people about Jesus. Well, I don't know anything. Exactly. That's why you tell someone about Jesus. They're going to ask you a question you don't know. What are you going to do? You're going to go find out how. You're going to find out why. What happened to Paul? Paul had a revelation. God blinded him so he could catch vision. Sometimes you have to have something snatched away from you so you can see properly. He took that, he took that uh, vision that he had, murdering Christians and arresting Christians, and then Christ himself shows up in his life and says, hey, why are you doing this to me? And then Paul repented. Lord, have mercy upon me. And then when he was finished that encounter, he says, Paul, I want you to go to this town. I want you to go to this street, and there's going to be a man there. Do what he tells you. Ooh. You see, that's where many of us walk away. Ain't no man going to tell me what to do. They're just a man. No, we're not just men. We're sons of God. And we need each other. We're not just a woman. You're women of God, mothers of nations, and you need each other. And we need connection like that. You can't just do this on your own. You can't just show up on a Sunday and have an experience. That's the new thing. Now come and experience. Really? No, come and change your wicked heart. Right? That's what I needed. I've been to the experiences. I've done the religion the first 19 years of my marriage and my ministry with all my theology. I've done that. I'd rather have needles stuck in my eye than do that again. Because it brought death, destruction. I hurt people, hurt my family by being a big fat fake. More emphasis on the fake than the fat. I'm just trying to be real with you guys today. I'm not sitting at a place that's unachievable. We just that far apart. Just far enough for me to reach my hand out and grab yours. And then I'm hoping when you leave here today, you'll reach a hand out and grab his. Right? We're all lost in need of a loving God. Amen? We need this. And we need to know. Here's what Jesus said. I made the statement that if your heart Actually, I didn't say this yet. I wrote this down this morning. Do not be deceived. If your heart does not ache for what causes God's heart to ache, then you don't know him. This message about being ready for eternity is what makes God's heart ache. It's why he's held back the return of Jesus. Because many people have made up their mind. People have already decided but just maybe your life could make a change. Not your theology, your life. When they say, hey, you're going to tell me about Jesus? What do you know? I say, all I know is the pieces in my heart. Sometimes that's all the theology you need because people are looking for peace. And peace is the byproduct of recognizing you have nothing. Peace is the byproduct when you seek his righteousness, when you seek his goodness. Your goodness all your goodness does is make you look at yourself. You become self-conscious and all you see is all the sins you can, all the lies that you have made and all the lies you're trying to keep up. All the pretending. Oh, it's so tough to pretend. The most miserable people in the world are not those who don't know Jesus. See, here's the thing. I believe that people who've never heard the gospel preached will be in heaven where some who have heard it preached will not. 
Why? Because he's a just God. He's not going to judge you on what you don't know. God's not stupid. I've been in places where the gospel has never been preached, and here's what I see. They don't know the Bible at all, and this is what is there. They know not to touch another man's wife. How do they know that? They know that it's wrong to take what doesn't belong to you. How do they know that? Because all of us, God has put in your DNA who he is. All of us know that there is something. We hear the nonsense higher power, and I get it. That's, that's people who, 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 who are created by God, and they know there's a higher power, but they want to deny that it's Jesus. Why do people deny Jesus? The price. The price. The only reason I don't drive a Lamborghini. The price. I'm not going to pay it. I won't even buy a new Chevy right now. The price. I'm going to stay in my little Honda for a while. I just will not pay more for a vehicle than I paid for my house the first time I bought one. And I'm 59 years old. I could do that if I wanted to. I'm putting myself in a box here now. Are you hearing me? The price. Verse 42 in Matthew 24, I'm going to cut some of it out. No, no, I need to read, I need to read this. Matthew 24, verse 38. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. You see, the, the entering of the ark is symbolic of today's rapture that's about ready to take place. The doors open. Noah told everybody, come. There's a flood coming. I'm here telling you today, Jesus is coming. I'm here telling you, you don't know when your heart's going to stop beating. The Bible says as a tree falls, that's how it lies. You die unsaved, you stay unsaved. That's hectic. But that's not fair. Yes, it is fair. You're being warned right now. Make a decision. Make a choice in your heart today. I'm going to give my heart to Christ. Not just out of appearance or status but I want to know him this is what he's saying here he says as it was in the days of Noah so shall it be when the son of man returns for in those days and I, and I read that already and Noah entered the ark and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away that is how it will be at the second coming people have been warned so much about Jesus especially here in America Americans we have no excuse we have been told. We have been warned over and over and over again. It's funny, after, it's not funny, it's the wrong term. After 9-11, people started going to church again like crazy. And when I say church, I use that word kind of loosely because that includes a lot of nonsense. And, and, and we saw that increase. And then he, almost immediately, the, the politicians singing God Bless America on the footsteps. They, won't, they wouldn't do that today. You know, they, they just, it's changed so fast. God, we need you in a time of crisis, but a crisis will never cause you to come to Christ. It's been proven. The flood, it didn't matter to people. Telling people about the rapture, it doesn't matter. 9-11, doesn't matter. On the battlefield, yeah, I'll serve Jesus. Come home, do whatever. People, it comes to a decision. What do you want your children to have? What do you want this next generation to have? And so what does he say here? Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women getting their nails done. Not too many people grind corn anymore to make bread, right? So I'm just changing. Two women are going to be out doing what women do when they go out and get their nails done. And one's going to be getting her nails done. The other one's just going to disappear. Her ring's going to fall on the table. She's gone. Her ring, her clothes, her shoes, even the polish that was on her nails, on the floor. What, is, what just happened? And yet the person who sees that, they've been in church. They've heard about the rapture. I have a theory of what the news media is going to use. They're going to use global warming. People who are a little bit off on this religion thing just disappeared. They vaporized because they were the cause of global warming. You know, you're laughing. You're laughing. 
that there's posters that are being changed around the world says in 2020 this glacier will be gone today it's twice as big what they do they change it they move the clock you see that's what happens in time and space when you have no real power when you have a false power of dollar or fame or reputation we're busted guys all we have is Jesus and our hope needs to be in him and he wants you to have things he wants you to enjoy life I'm looking forward today to sit back and watch football with family and, and just enjoy family. But first is Jesus. Jesus, then football. Jesus, then coffee. Right? Jesus, right? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. How many need peace in your life today? I've run out of time. Can we just stand to our feet? And I'm going to read this last verse that in the book of Revelation, I think I've already read the first part of this today, but it says the sea gave up the dead and the death and the grave gave up their dead and all were judged according to their deeds. This is not a place you want to be, but it's just as simple as making a decision. And here's the thing. Put that aside. I can tell you this life is amazing with Jesus in the center. Doesn't matter what you do and what your thing is and what you enjoy, God wants you to enjoy life. He wants you to enjoy the things of this world. He just doesn't want it to be your God. He just wants to be first. And then he said, everything you need will be added to you. He loves you today. Don't allow condemnation to set in. Don't allow sense of loss to set in when you give your heart to Christ. You don't lose anything, you gain. You lose the depression and you get peace. You lose the turmoil inside and you, you get strong-minded. And suddenly you don't need to take so many happy pills. Suddenly your mental condition, is so, some of the things we're medicating need to really be cast out. Some of the things we're trying to counsel people through, they need the demonic presence that put it there to be removed from them. And then give them the tools to make good decisions. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This life is just full of synthetic joy, synthetic peace, and synthetic happiness. And Satan knows if he can get you locked into a false synthetic high, that you'll never have the joy. Why? Because the Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. It is the sustaining power that will take you from time and space to eternity. Can we just bow our heads and close our eyes for a moment? Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for how you're speaking to the hearts of your children today. And Lord, today we, we commit to you that we have nothing. We submit to you today, Lord, that you would take anything we have to offer. Lord, it's, it's for your use, for your purpose. And God, I pray that anybody suffering anything in their life today, God, that they would submit it to you, to start a relationship with you, and to allow the things that seem to have tore us down to take us to a new place in you. That we're not limited to time and space and natural, but Lord, we become connected with eternity and the supernatural. And Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to the hearts of people today to make a decision, to make a choice, to become a son, a daughter of God, to, to say yes to that relationship. God has already said yes. He's saying today, come home. Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and beat up by religion and let me show you how to rest. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, 29, and 30. He's speaking to your heart today. And while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I want to ask a question today. If you've never given your heart to Christ, you've never been born again, he's knocking at your heart's door today. We all need his mercy. And he will give you a fill of mercy that you can give it to your friends, to your family, maybe your spouse, maybe your children, maybe your parents. He wants you to be that conduit of his love to this world. He wants to flow through you that as he flows, he can heal you today that he can renew your mind and take that depression away, take that insecurity away and let you understand your identity is in him. He is your father. No matter what the earthly fathers may have done, the hurts and the pains we may have gone through with earthly father wounds, 
that today you'll be healed by the only Father that will be in eternity is our Heavenly Father. And He will parent us for an eternity. While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, make that decision right now. Say yes to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Again, while heads are bowed, I want to ask you this question. If you did pass right now, do you know where you would go? Do you know if you have a relationship with God? And be honest with yourself and just make this the day. Make this your birthday. Make this is the day that you were born again. See, when you were born of your parents, it gives you the right to walk the planet. But if you want to walk in eternity, you must be born again. And the culture's argument is always, hey, I was born this way. Sure, we all were. We were all born into sin. But that's why Jesus came, that, that we wouldn't have to settle for the decision that Adam and Eve made, that we would have an opportunity to choose for ourselves. Because the second Adam came, it was Jesus. He was also in a garden. Just like Adam failed him in the garden, Jesus came back and beat the devil in a garden as well. Why? So Mike Rittenhouse could get his life right with Jesus. So you could come right with the Lord. His mercy, His grace, it's free. And I want to ask you with no one looking around, with all the boldness and the pride of who Jesus is, and the excitement of being healed and restored, lift that hand and say yes to Jesus. I need Jesus. If you need Him today, just lift that hand high and say, I want this relationship today. If that's you, just quickly raise your hand and put it back down again. Thank you. Anybody else? Today I need Jesus. Just lift that hand and put it back down again as a surrender to Him today.